Today I am talking to Sasha Black. Sasha Black is a best-selling and competition-winning author, rebel podcaster, speaker, and craft teacher. She has published many nonfiction books along with a young adult fantasy series and her newest release eight steps to side characters is coming out this week eight steps to side characters is a comprehensive writing guide that will help you create the side characters your story needs so i'm so excited for you to learn from sasha about how to level up your side characters in your writing so let's get started with the interview welcome back to the channel Sasha Black. Sasha was here over a year ago talking about her nonfiction book, The Anatomy of Prose. Now we're here to talk about Eight Steps to Side Characters, which is publishing this week. I read an early copy of this book and it's so amazing and has forever changed the way that I look at side characters. So welcome back, Sasha. Thank you so much for having me. I cannot believe it's been a year. I know. The time, where has the time gone? <laughs> If anyone hasn't watched that amazing interview, which I will link in the description, please let us know how long you've been publishing and what other nonfiction craft books you published. Okay, so I think I first published in 2017. So what is that, four years or so now? And I have published a book on villains, so how to create better villains, a book on how to create better heroes, and now a book on side characters. And then you mentioned the uh, anatomy of prose as well, which teaches you how to improve your sentence level uh, writing. And then I also did uh, like a collaboration and did a couple of short books with Jay Thorne on like rebel mindset and personal finance as indie authors. And then I also publish uh, fantasy. So I have some young adult stuff out and I'm kind of in the background brewing up some adult fantasy stuff as well. That's awesome. You're like a machine with nonfiction craft books. I love it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I wanted to ask what made you choose side characters as the topic for this specific your next uh, upcoming book what was the, the spark for it so i would love to tell you that there was some wonderful story behind this but of all of my non-fiction books this is the one that probably has the lamest uh, answer for that so basically you know i started with villains then i'd written heroes well really left there was only side characters in terms of like types of character so that was one of the drivers and then the other driver was that i like my audience asked me to write this book like I said to them what do you want me to write and they all said um well, it was it was very close a very close tie between side characters and working on description so that will be my next big book for next year I'll be working on uh, a book on how to do better description but I'm just doing like a mini non-fiction book that I'm not really talking about right now that I'm aiming to get out in January but we'll see because I don't know if I can do it yet um but yeah, there's like a little mini book also uh, coming. But yeah, so I mean, essentially, it was a toss up between my audience asking for this, because there actually isn't really a lot in the market on side characters. There's a lot on characters and how to mm. write good characters, but not so much specifically on side characters. Yeah. And, and then the fact that, you know, I've covered the other two big characters in, in every story already. So yeah. So in your opinion, what are the different types of side characters? So there are lots of different ways that you can come at this. And I think people will be expecting me to talk about like archetypes, but I don't really think that archetypes are a helpful way when you are learning to write a book of thinking about side characters. So I come at this from a different angle and I come at it from um, saying there are three types of side character, cameos, minor and major side characters. And I'll explain briefly what each of them are. So for anybody who has watched The Matrix, this is like my, I love this example more than any other example in the book. In The Matrix, 
for anyone who hasn't watched the matrix the matrix is essentially an artificially intelligent created world where humans are plugged into and neo is pulled out of this matrix back into the real world which is like this decimated dystopian wasteland and the the aim is to like destroy the ais who created this and in training he goes back inside the matrix and they're in what looks like a very bog standard new york downtown street and all of a sudden this late and so i should just say everybody is dressed in like black grays they're all carrying briefcases nobody's looking at each other and then all of a sudden this woman in a red dress walks past neo and that's it. That's the only time she's in the whole film. It's this very brief flash, instantaneous view of this woman. And the only thing you remember is that she was wearing a red dress and she was kind of cute and she maybe she had blonde hair. I can't even remember if she did have blonde hair. And that's it. And the, the, the film is obviously like two hours long, but she's in it for about 10 seconds. And that's what a cameo is. They're in your story for a flash, for an instant. And they might not have any lines. I don't think she even has any lines. Um, Maybe they hold the door open. Maybe they uh, they hand you something. But that's about it. So they have no effect on the story, really. And they're entirely forgettable. They might not even have names. So that's what a cameo is. And the other, the other example I like to use is Stan Lee. He always used to, in his Marvel films, so like... You know, he drove a truck or he was a judge or he was a doctor or whatever. And but like, you know, and sometimes he said a line or two, but most of the time he didn't. So, yeah, that's a that's a cameo. A minor side character is like a step up from that. So these are the characters who are going to be in your book more frequently than a cameo, but they're not really going to have a lasting effect on your story. So Maybe they're a barman that the protagonist talks to sometimes. Maybe they're a guard that they get to see and maybe the guard gives them a key because they made a friendship or whatever. Um, so they may be important to like a plot situation, but they wouldn't be important in terms of character development, like pushing the protagonist or, you know, being an obstacle, stuff like that. So they could be like a barman or a receptionist or, you know, someone who brings information, performs a role, but they don't really impact the story and they don't really impact the main character. So like to give you some tangible examples of that i know everybody has a problem with uh, jk rowling but harry potter is a very well-known story so i do use examples from that despite my disagreeing with jk rowling so mr filch is a very good example of a minor character he's the janitor the one with the mancoon cat and the big foof ball and so the janitor mr filch he appears every so often and sometimes he causes a bit of trouble for the for, or the cat causes trouble for harry but you know really he could come out of the story and that you know it would be fine the story would still be fine it would be the same story another example would be wheezy from toy story and like a magda from the hunger Games. so i don't even think she's in the film but she's in the book and you know she's there at the beginning that's about it so there's some examples of some minor characters your major side characters are who I predominantly aim my book at. So your major side characters are the ones who have a big role in your in your story. It might be the mentor type figure, you know, Gandalf, for example. It could be uh, your protagonist's best friend. So like Roy Weasley, Hermione Granger, Grandpa Joe in the Char Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is another example. These characters have depth. They might might have their own art they might have a narrative point of view as well they're probably going to have subplots dedicated to them they'll take up a lot of page time and they will leave a mark on both the story and your protagonist so yeah i that is how i break down my side characters because i think it is a more useful mechanism for structuring your writing and for knowing where to place the emphasis in the story because a lot of people struggle with letting side characters take over and so using this structure helps prevent that i love that i love the all the examples i'm a big example person so thank you so much <laughs> for that so how do you think writers should approach side characters versus a protagonist so I think two of the most important things to bear in mind are tied up with each other. 
so your side characters are not the most important characters in your story. The story is about the protagonist and therefore everything that your side characters do um, must be bent or angled towards the protagonist. Now that said, you still want your characters to at least look like they have life outside of the protagonist in order to make them seem, you know, full of depth and like they are a real character. Because if they exist only your protagonist, then they're going to be very flat and it's going to be cheesy. So a couple of things to think about are creating an illusion of an arc with your protagonist your the whole book is about your protagonist so you go in depth into your protagonist's character arc but you don't have the time or page space to do that with your side characters so you create the illusion of an arc now the way that you do that is you work out what it is your side character wants if it can be connected to the theme even better i think we'll talk about this later but if you can connect it to the theme even better because that will help to bolster your protagonist but you start out with them wanting something at the end of the book either they're going to have got that thing or they're not going to have gotten that thing and and in in minimum viable character that is all that you need to create at least the illusion of an arc if you want to create a bit more depth to that arc then you could have a stop point a couple of stop points in between uh, in scenes where your character tries to get the thing or perhaps they're grappling with whatever it is they have to do in order to get that thing and you know importantly if you can try and weave those in so that it's still about the protagonist. Perhaps your protagonist is helping the side character to, to achieve their arc or whatever, then all the better for creating that, you know, holistic mesh where everything is connected to everything else. So yeah, unlike your protagonist where you're going to have you know, half a dozen different locations where they're trying to overcome obstacles or examining that thing inside them that's created the floor. Your side characters aren't going to have that and they shouldn't have that. They should only have the beginning where they don't have it or or they, they're working out what they want, the end where they have it or they, they failed, and then, you know, a point or two in the middle where they're grappling with that. And then that is connected to scene power. So scene power is this concept that when, and it doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert, but when you walk into a room, let's say you're walking into a dinner party, it's usually very obvious who is holding the attention in that room? Who is in charge of that room? Where where are everybody's eyes? Where's everybody's energy directed? And it's usually to um, the host in, in that uh, instance. And so you can compare that host to the protagonist in any story. What you don't want to do is have your side characters driving any action or decisions in a scene. So, for example, if you have come together as a group, your characters have come together and they're trying to work through clues or create a plan, it whilst your side characters can be giving information and providing clues or uh, helping to work things out, it should all, all be directed towards the protagonist and the protagonist should be the one making the decision. So the protagonist should be the one saying, I will be the sacrificial lamb, not a side character saying, well, why don't you do it? Or not the, or not the side character saying, oh, I should do it. Unless, of course, your hero then jumps in and says, oh, no, 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 I'm going to do it because you know, then it makes their sacrifice look better or whatever so another example of this is like if you have a police officer so you're writing crime and you have always you always have your police officer detective person and then you have their a sidekick you know sergeant or whatever the sergeant shouldn't should be presenting information or picking up clues but it should always 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 be the detective who pieces those clues together and goes aha i've got it and that means that they that detective is controlling the scene power because he's taken all the bits of information or she's taken all the bits of information from the side characters and pieced it together you can't have your side characters doing that because then the locus of power is with them and that's not where it should be so that is a couple of different ways to yeah like look at your side characters differently or to you know how you should approach them differently I love the visual of the dinner party. That's that's fantastic. And I will always remember that. So thank you. So what sort of research did you have to do for this book? 
I tend to, so I know we know about drinks, <laughs> but I have high learner and high input. So I always like a lot of information anyway. So with all of my nonfiction books, I tend to heavily research a lot of articles. I read lots of books and then, and that's like on the nonfiction side. So I'm looking for other craft information. I'm looking for craft books. There were actually, there isn't a single book on side characters out there, not one. There are, there are books on characters, but there are no books on side characters so I, this is the first book on side characters uh, specifically uh, so yeah I read a lot of books about characters I read a lot of books about craft story structure and I read a lot of articles as well and then I also go away and I, I get to do the fun bit which is like binge reading and binge watching stuff as well I tend to go and try and consume as much information as possible and then I spend some time like subconsciously processing it all because I have a different way of looking at craft I think and I like to have my own spin on it so for example I mentioned earlier about how I I look at it in terms of major minor and cameo most people look at side characters in terms of archetypes but I didn't want to do that I like to give people a new way to look at these things so I need some time to process and and so yeah that is I would say how I do most of my research and then I just start vomiting and collecting quotes and things so yeah I always love that fun research where it's like oh I'm doing research I'm gonna watch these 10 movies or uh binge these tv shows so I love yeah. that <laughs> our job is awesome I know. What are some ways that writers can level up their side characters? Okay, so earlier on, I'm going to start with this one. Earlier on, I mentioned the fact that your side characters, you need to create this illusion of an arc with a side character. So I talk about the three whys. Each side character should have three whys. So why are they helping the protagonist? Or, you know, if they're on the villain side, then why are they opposing the protagonist? And then... And I should also point out, I am talking about major side characters. I'm not talking about minor and cameos. And then you need to look at what is like, what is their why for existing outside of the protagonist? So what do they want? What is their why? Like their why for existing? What is it that they want that's outside of the protagonist? Do they, is the protagonist trying to get to the Olympics? Perhaps they are trying to be a mathlete, you know, so something that is external to the protagonist. And then they need a why for being in each scene because so many characters, well, you'll see these great groups of people coming into a scene and then three or four out of the six are all talking and then all of a sudden the author's describing that the six characters are leaving the scene again and you're a bit like wait what like where did they, those characters come from so why are they in the scene why do they exist outside of the protagonist and why are they existing for the protagonist those three whys really help and then I think the thing that is most important or, or the thing that I hope most people take away from the book is around getting your characters to work with the theme. So for example, your protagonist, if, if your book was maths equation, your protagonist would be the answer to that equation. Your antagonist or your villain is the incorrect answer to that equation. And your side characters are the workings out along the way. And what I mean by that is that if your protagonist is the embodiment of your theme, that's the message that you're trying to give out, then your side characters should represent different aspects of that, different workings out. So if you um, have a side character that represents perhaps a negative version of that theme, that's either going to show your protagonist that that's what they want to or isn't what they want because it's not the same embodiment. So if we put this into to tangible examples um I was gonna do love but I'm gonna have to use the center because that's the only thing in my head right now so my book the scent of death is about a boy who gets punched on the nose and then he can smell how people can uh, are gonna die and he's had a really rough upbringing and all he wants to do is save the people that he loves and that's really the theme like if you love somebody you should save them but the other characters are all different versions of that and him seeing each of those different versions helps him to learn the lesson that you can't save everybody. So for example, Pearl, who is the love interest, she is a very independent woman. She's a cheeky rebel, doesn't need saving, thank you very much. 
So that's her embodiment on the theme. She doesn't need saving because she's going to save herself. And so that is a different variation of his theme, which is if you love somebody, you should save them. Another character, Frank, is gay and he's in the closet and he's struggling with coming out because his family background, they're not very pro-gay people and so it's difficult for him to come out. So his version on the theme is um, if he loves himself, he should save himself by coming out of the closet. He should save his mental health. So again, it's another variation on the theme. And I think when you, and I go into a lot more detail on like the different ways you can represent themes. So, you know, like sticking with the theme truth or sticking with a lie or flipping from positive to negative, negative to positive, so on and so forth in the book. So there's more information on that. But I think that so many writers just slap on some side characters to create some humor or to create dialogue to you know increase the pace and they don't think about tying it all together with the theme and it's so easy to do it if you know how so yeah like that would be one of the biggest uh things i think you can level up your characters so on the flip side what are some mistakes or the biggest mistakes that you see how writers mess up side characters yeah, okay, so we talked a bit about scene power, giving side characters too much scene power. We also talked about them not having uh, a reason to exist outside of the protagonist. And I think the other one that I probably haven't mentioned is, so two more. One is not giving them anything distinctive. So each of your major side characters should have a little je ne sais quoi about them, a little something that is memorable. So one example I always remember from the movie East is East, I don't know if you you've ever seen that it's quite it's 90s I think it's 90s or noughties film anyway and it's set in Birmingham UK I think in like the 80s I want to say and basically this kid called Sajid he he always wears this green bomber jacket and it's filthy and it stinks and he's smelly but like you never see him without the jacket and it's a thing like in the in the whole through the whole film and so yeah each of your characters should have a thing that makes them stand out and maybe it's a physical thing maybe they always wear a particular shade of lipstick or maybe it's the personality thing so like Kaz Brecker in The Six of Crows always walks with a crow head cane and always wears gloves now Bardugo who wrote the book made a thing out of the gloves and the gloves are linked to his floor which is a fantastic way of like bringing that web of connectivity together but each of your side characters should have a thing maybe it's their type of humor and you know they have a very specific type of humor or maybe it's their dialogue or their dialect but each of your side characters should have something distinctive about them that is unique only to them and differentiates them from everybody else. Yeah, so I think that is probably, you know, there's a lot of sameness um, or blandness that, you know, these characters don't, that they're put in, but they don't really have any pizzazz about them. And so they just, they sort of all merge into everybody else. Yeah, for sure. That's, it's difficult as a reader to, to not be able to differentiate side characters. So I think as an author to, to be able to do that up front is really helpful. So how has this book specifically changed or updated your view on side characters in your fiction? Wow. The interesting thing about this is that I realized how much I love side characters. And the funny thing is, in studying so many side characters and how unique they are and how that's reflected in my own fiction, it's actually made me realize I have to work more on my protagonists, if anything, which I think is funny because, you know, we, I do actually spend quite a lot of time creating my side characters and giving them that unique thing. And actually, funnily enough, some of my favorite own characters are side characters. And I'm like, this should not be the case. Like, why is my protagonist or, you know, or my villain not my favorite thing? So yeah, it's, it. The, I think what I have learned is I actually spend a lot of time on my side characters and they're really fun. And they're fun because you aren't as restricted with your side characters as you are with your protagonist. And so uh, the lesson I have taken away is to have more fun with my protagonist and to, to make them as distinctive as I make my side characters. While I was reading your book as well, like it felt like sort of a case study to read about the scent of death. And I think a lot of the exercises that you talk about to do for side characters will definitely help me and other other writers who read this book so 
<laughs> yeah, it it was important. Like, obviously, we have to be careful because of copyright. There's fair usage and stuff, so you can quote very small things from people. But it's really important to me to have examples in my books. And the only way I could do that, I think, was with The Scent of Death because I have so carefully structured it in a particular way to create a particular effect to get a particular ending. And, uh, you know, I it was actually really quite difficult not to give away the big ending or the big twist but like whilst also going into quite a lot of detail about how you can put some of these things into practice but yeah like i hope people find it useful uh who are your favorite side characters in books movies television and why oh my goodness me this was this was the hardest question like of all the questions okay so i'm just gonna reel off a few and i reserve the right to change my mind because <laughs> You know, these things change as, as we go. What I came up with was because it was such an iconic movie and Morpheus was so damn cool and I just wanted to be Morpheus. Like, we, he had he has, like, really high self-assurance and he's probably, like, number one self-assurance and I just, I loved his confidence and he just knew, he knew stuff and he believed it and, and it made it true and that's what I loved about him. I read The House in on the on the Cerulean Sea or in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Clue recently and oh my goodness me it is just 400 pages of joy and it has the antichrist in the book and the, he of all of the characters I have ever read he has the single best dialogue lines I have ever read of any character ever so that is high praise um and his personality is just this wonderful juxtaposition, which is why I liked him. Got to give a mention to Game of Thrones. I loved Cersei Lannister and Ira Stark. And at the moment, I am watching Scandal. And so that is a, a Shonda Rhimes TV series. And I really like Huck. Huck is this assassin character who's deeply complex, very broken, and is this wonderful juxtaposition of pure un unadulterated violence and the most kind-hearted caring thoughtful person I think I've ever come across and like it, it is just two unexpected things that you don't think should be thrown together but work beautifully and so yeah I would say he is my favorite side character at this minute also just a, a little nod to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy uh, and Terry Pratchett who have some of the funniest side characters ever. Death for example in Mort is fantastic one of my favorite incarnations of death in any book ever. That's awesome I love Scandal and that is a really good example of a lot of like side characters. I think it's easier in television because you can really explore these side characters, but Huck is fantastic. And it's like one of those, you know, wolf in sheep's clothing type of thing. Like he's not necessarily a villain, but like you get to know his he backstory and you're like, yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's who he is. Okay. He's, he's just so deeply complex. Like and that's yeah. the, I just, I, I, it truly he is one of the best side characters I've seen in a long time. All right, so how has your writing process for nonfiction changed since writing any of your previous books? So this is a really hard question because a lot of my process is still the same. So I still do lots of research. I still throw down information in the same way. I think what has changed is my ability to explain complex topics in an easy to understand way and I don't I think I've always done that because I do do that in villains but I think I have got significantly better at it over the years so hopefully each book is better than the last um and I think that just comes down to experience and you know, constantly analysing story, be it in the cinema, be it in poetry, be it in uh, flash fiction or, or, or whatever in novels. And having more examples, I really like to create like metaphors or analogies or things that explain these complex story structures in an easy to understand way. And yeah, so I would say not change necessarily, but I do more of that and hopefully I'm better at it. 
than I was when I first started. So yeah, like, but the core of how I write nonfiction, I don't think has necessarily changed. I think I've got more confident with it and so possibly faster, but not changed. This is sort of an aside to on top of that. Has your, the way that you promote nonfiction changed from the beginning? Like, do you do anything different? Uh, do you find things that work and don't work? Can they not work and work between books? Or do you find that process to be pretty streamlined? Um, it's definitely changed because I didn't have a podcast at the beginning and I'm only just getting my first audiobook up off the ground. So yes, I would say some things have changed. Some things have stayed the same. So I try to do, you know, giveaways. I try to I write on my own blog. I will release newsletters. So those things stay the same. What has changed is I used to do a lot more article writing. Now I'm a bit more selective, but I think it's possibly because my time is more restricted. So I try to, rather than like going to my friends now, I will try and pitch people, target in a targeted way so like you know does this podcast have a big listenership does this blog have you know a big readership so I try to do those things a bit more tactically than I probably did previously and I also try and do a lot more video and audio so for example I'm going to run a series of live like interviews for my launch which I probably would never have done you know, four years ago when I first released Villains, I just wrote, I purely focused on on article writing, whereas now it's a lot more interviews, a lot more podcasting, a lot more video. Other things that stayed the same are I still run Amazon ads. Amazon ads is fantastic for nonfiction writers. Yeah, so I would say the leaning in terms of outreach that I do is a bit more video audio than it is purely words now I still try to do as much as I humanly can though that has never changed but you know as you as you grow up I was going to say but as you get more experienced in the industry you learn more and more things but the other thing that I would say is not if you are a nonfiction writer, don't necessarily listen to what I'm saying and assume that that is the case for all nonfiction books, because I think readerships are different. Like my nonfiction readership is very different to, say, um, uh, John, John Truby's. Uh, non-fiction writing craft audience because his books are far his book is far more formal it's more structured it's very used in like trad agents and stuff so whereas my non-fiction audience they're all naughty they're all cheeky they all like sarcasm and rude jokes and you know and so it's just a different type of audience and therefore the interaction might be different and so my advice to you is to experiment don't assume that whatever works for me is going to work for you you don't know that until you have done it and tried it at least two or three times to know whether or not that's going to work for your audience and so I still experiment that's something else that's the same I still try new things each time I launch I try something new I pitch somebody different I um you know, I, 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 try, I try a different type of giveaway. I try collaborations, you know, all of these different things. I think as an indie, you just have to experiment with and see what works. And, and you've given me a lot of advice when it comes to uh, nonfiction, whether it's, you know, structuring a book and writing it and promoting it. So um, I love the uh, experimentation aspect of it as well, because I always try to look at any information out there from authors who are successful and just say, well, I'll try it, but it may not work for me because I think a lot of authors can feel disappointed when uh, mm -hmm. certain advice doesn't work for them. So in that vein, what are some of your best tips for authors wanting to write nonfiction? Okay, so two, I will say I've got two. The first one is the structure is the hardest thing. It is always the thing that changes the most. I, you know, it doesn't matter how many times I try and structure it, you know, and I suppose that's kind of like the outline, but it doesn't matter how many times I try and structure it before I write the book, it will always change as I go through because as you are compiling the information, it, uh, you still have to take the reader on a journey from, you know, base level information to here is the problem, here is some ways to solve it, here is, you know, how you implement it going forward or whatever, or whatever the journey is that you're taking your readers on. And as you are writing and explaining and, and laboring in your nonfiction book, that 
is a complex thing to do before you write down the things you need to write down. So always get somebody to read it who doesn't necessarily have knowledge on that area because that will they will be able to tell you whether or not you've taken them from zero information through to whatever it is, you know, and back down uh, that you need to. And the second thing I would say is to think about your voice. What voice do you want in your nonfiction? Like, we talk about voice a lot for characters and for fiction. And it's important because it's what they sound like. It's what you, it's the feeling that you get from them. But it is no less important in nonfiction. And the thing, like my bugbear with nonfiction is boring nonfiction, where people are really stuffy and there's no humor, there's no, you know, it's just dry and they're using big complex words and there's no fun analogies. Like I, I am... One of my one of my missions in life is to make learning fun. And so your voice matters. Like nonfiction is a chance for you to be yourself in a way that you can't be in fiction because you're being somebody else in fiction. And so yeah, put your best bits of you into your nonfiction. Put your humor in, put your your if you have a turn of you know, turns of phrases that you tend to use, yeah, it's your chance to really dig into who you are and your way of storytelling. It's, you know, it's storytelling in a whole nother model and, and version and and format. And so yeah, like thinking about your voice is super important. I had to learn a lot about that this year with writing, you know, my nonfiction and uh, just understanding that there's still that arc as you were talking about in nonfiction, which I never really thought about before. But when you read a book that doesn't really have that arc, you're like, oh, this is not great. And it doesn't have a great voice. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not learning anything. So you just want to make sure you learn how to do that. So what have been your favorite nonfiction books in the last year since we discussed that last year? Okay, so I'm going to give you three. There are lots more and I will give a nod to somebody else shortly. But so the number one, that had probably the biggest impact on me is The Heroine's Journey by Gail Carragher. And I didn't even know that there was a heroine's journey versus a hero's journey. And just to, just, just to explain, uh, a heroine can still be a male and a hero can still be a female. It is just the arc like the arc and the story structure that you go through. And I didn't know I was writing heroine's journeys and it has helped me resolve a lot of problems in um, my third book. So I am literally about to start editing it for the final time. So yes, that book. Another book called Effortless by Greg McCowan. I think that's how you say it, or McKeon. Anyway, fantastic, mind-blowing reminder that life doesn't have to be hard and that you can make things easier on yourself. And there is no excuse for not doing that. You don't have to live a hard, difficult life. And the last one was Tell Don't Show by Something Loft. Kissed, I think I can give you the links to these and that I read that book during a time where I was trying to learn how to skinny draft and it basically has enabled me to fast draft my first draft of any fiction book which is speeding up my ability to write and it just gave me permission to tell the first draft and to not necessarily have to write every single word that I want to be in the in in the finished book in the first draft if my first draft is only 20k or only 50k or only 40k whatever fine so be it you know I can list I can just just do straight dialogue in the scene or or I can just write bullet point notes about the description or the setting and then just get the plot down or just get the character you know, emotion in a, in a scene, whatever it is that I have, it gave me permission to get that down in my skinny draft. And it has changed the way that I write fiction. Um, and it was so freeing. And uh, yeah, so I, I really, I like that, but it's so short as well. I think it's only about 50 pages, but it was like the best 50 pages I've paid for in a long time, <laughs> apart from, apart from the heroine's journey, which was also fantastic. That's awesome. I read the heroine's journey as well. And I always found it very difficult as an outliner to put my characters in the hero's journey. And I was always like, but that doesn't really fit. So I'll like write it. And my books are like different because of that. And I'm like, I don't feel good about that. And then I read hero's journey and I was like, or heroine's journey. And I was like, Oh, I was doing that the whole time. I just didn't have like a name for it, but I do want to check out that the third book you mentioned, because I do 
we, we started skeleton drafting, you know, sort of at the same mm -hmm. time. And I found the process super freeing. So anything that can help me is definitely helpful. So I will link all of those books in the description as well for anyone who wants to check them out. Yes. And I will give a final shout out to Dan Wilcox, who wrote the self-publishing blueprint. And I think he's been on, has he been on or is he coming on? Yes. Um, yeah. And that was also fantastic. Yeah. So, and it just like a step-by-step -step guide to getting your book out of the door, the publishing door. So yeah. Yes. That was a great book as well. So what can we expect from you in the near future, fiction or nonfiction wise? Okay. So as you know, Sign Characters is out this week and I'm also going back and I am narrating my nonfiction. So I am in the process of getting audiobooks out as well. So I'm starting with villains. Then I'm doing the anatomy of prose and then I'll do side characters and then I'll do heroes. I'm also going to be running a series of masterclasses in the fall. So probably from September onwards, I will be running one masterclass per book and if you can't attend you'll be able to like buy it afterwards so that's also coming and then next year I will be releasing a book on description and hopefully a little mini book that I can't talk about yet in January and in terms of fiction I've got books three and four coming out probably no November, January, November, December, October, November, depending on how fast I can do it. So they're coming. And then the book that I talk about inside characters at the scent of death will be out next year by the end of next year, I would have thought. That's very exciting. And I love hearing a list, <laughs> the, the yeah. list of things to come. <laughs> Um, I, I did want to plug uh, your Instagram event that you mentioned. Can you give us a little more information about that and what to expect? Yes. So it's called Your Side Characters and You. And what I'm trying to do is talk to indie authors about both their side characters um, in, in their own fiction books, their favorite side characters in TV and movies and shows, and then I'm trying to extract a little bit of advice from them about how they create their side characters and then just like have a bit of fun and I'll be doing these on Instagram uh, every night from the 30th until the 8th or 9th and they're at 8 p.m UK time uh yeah and I'm gonna have your very lovely self on one of them I don't remember this exact date I'm sure you can add it in post August 1st um, yeah there we go August 1st yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so I I will be doing those every night from from the 30th so I'm so excited for those events and please tell us where we can find you elsewhere on the interwebs. Okay, so my website is sashablack.co.uk, which is S-A-C-H-A, -A, and then the color black.co.uk. I'm most active on Instagram, which is at Sasha Black Author. And you can find my books are all wide, so you can find my books anywhere. You can even order them from the library if you prefer. And I do have a Facebook group, which is Rebel Authors, which is quite active and a fun place to be too. And of course, my podcast, the Rebel Author Podcast. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sasha, for joining me again. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, be sure to order your copy of Eight Steps to Side Characters, which is coming out this week, which is so exciting. So we're going to wrap it up here and I'll see you soon.